Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today um, on our presentation on the Kelly's Island Glacial Grooves Geological Preserve. Um, my name is J.D. Stucker. I am with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Division of Geological Survey. Um, and today we wanted to discuss um, some of the recent and upcoming work uh, that's been occurring at the Glacial Grooves. Um, this is all work with the goal of um, improving the visitor experience up there and helping maintain that site uh, for the future. And we're really excited about uh, sharing some of these very early, this very early stage work with you. Um, so that, you know, as um, you're up at the island and, and at the site, if you, if you see work and things occurring, we wanted to make sure that uh, people had an opportunity to kind of know and, and find out ahead of time what's going on. A um, couple housekeeping notes over on the right side of your screen. Um, you may see a uh, Q&A box. Um, feel free to use that Q&A box as an um, opportunity to you know, submit questions um, throughout the uh, presentation. Uh, we'll be able to get to those at the end of the presentation. Uh, we're also going to be taking this and putting it on the um, ODNR YouTube. Um, so you'll be able to, if you're not viewing this live at the moment, um, just know there'll be some contact information at the end of the presentation where you'll be able to submit your questions and things um, after the fact. Um, so thank you very much, Gene. Um, as, you're, um, as you may be aware, uh, the Kelly's Island Glacial Grooves are actually owned by the Ohio History Connection, um, but fall within Kelly's Island State Park. Um, there's a long-term arrangement between the Ohio History Connection and ODNR, where ODNR provides uh, maintenance and helps with the daily operations uh, of the site. And so we've been working very closely with the History Connection um, in, in partnership with them on, on all of the projects and things that we're going to be talking about uh, today. So I also wanted to take a moment to acknowledge some of the other organizations. You know, when you have a site that's as remarkable as the Glacial Grooves and you say, hey, we want to do some work uh, to improve visitor experience and, and, and preservation of the site. Um, it's such an interesting and unique project, and it really makes people excited to work on it. And people just come out of the woodwork hoping to be involved in something like this. And so we've had um, people from the Division of Engineering here within the Department of Natural Resources, Sam Cothran, um, several geologists that work with me at the Division of Geological Survey, um, We've had folks from the Division of Natural Areas, the Division of Wildlife. Um, we have Chris Ashley with us today, the park manager of Kelly's Island State Park with the Division of Parks and Watercraft. Um, we've been working, like I said, with the Ohio History Connection and Bill Can Kennedy and others there. Um, and then also we have a two representatives with us today from SNME Inc., uh, Mike Rowland and Gene Ramsey, who we'll be hearing a little bit from uh, here in a minute. And so, as you can imagine, as a geologist, getting to work on this project is particularly interesting to me. The glacial grooves are, are one of the best examples of this sort of feature in the world. This particular site, as many of you know, is over 400 feet long. Um, the grooves were formed maybe 20,000 uh, years ago um, in, in limestone that's 400 million years old. And... and there, as, as geologists and geosurvey, we're just thrilled to be part of this project. Um, if you visited the site recently, you're probably familiar with the geography and the surroundings and some of the features there. Um, obviously, this site is exposed to the weather. Um, it is, um, is exposed approximately through coring activity approximately 50 years ago, and the vegetation growth has is expectedly changed a lot over those years. You know how vegetation growth, the trees around the grooves, as well as within the grooves and the, and the different vegetation and stuff there has, has, has really um, has grown a lot in that time. Um, the chain link fencing, the posts and, and that you see in the images, the image here um, is all of the original things that were installed in the 1970s, um, as well as the footbridge that the photographer is currently standing on as they're kind of looking to the east here, um, the direction this photo was taken. Um, you're at kind of a topographic high when you're visiting the glacial grooves, and but and so there's no real water control or anything that's going on up there for drainage. Um, and, and the one thing a lot of people don't recognize about the site is um, if you kind of look just off to the left past an image that's being shown, past the trees and that fence, um, you actually look out into the old quarry where millions of tons of limestone were quarried for 
million, many, many years. Um, and uh, there's basically a steep drop off as you as you see the high wall right there of the quarry. Um, and that uh, is something I think a lot of people you know aren't aware of now that a lot of the um, the vegetation has really grown um, has grown there. And so you know the impetus for a lot of what we're looking at here was you know we receive lots of questions all the time not only about the science behind the glacial grooves and, and how they formed but also about you know how have they changed how have they weathered in the past 50 years and and you know what's being done uh to improve them you know recently the ohio history connection um installed a new um, ada accessible ramp and sidewalk as well as some new interpretive signage and um, that stuff is all is all been terrific and that's been done in the last couple of years and so we started to ask ourselves what more can we do um even above and beyond what what has recently been done and so we decided to kind of bring in a third party and so we hired snme inc to come in and we worked with them to develop kind of the the four main goals or the tenets of the project that we wanted to develop with them uh, the first of which was what are we going to do to protect the grooves? So we want to understand and, and document the current condition of, of, of the geologic features and of the rock and the surrounding area. Um, we want to make sure that we understand what it's like today, but also what it might be like in 50 more years and how has it changed in the past 50 years? And then, and then to that end, the second tenant was, was preservation. So what do we need to do based on what we find um, in our in our documentation of the conditions, what might we need to be doing differently in order to make sure we're doing the best possible job of maintaining this um, remarkable site? And, and the next step moves into kind of the visitor experience. So we want to make sure that when people come up there, they have the best possible experience, and that all the infrastructure that supports this site um, is is remarkable as the site itself. And we want to make sure we're approaching this from a, a geo heritage perspective that um, not only are we interested in the geologic feature, but we're interested in, in the history of the island and the quarrying history and and the whole holistic picture of, of this wonderful geologic preserve. And that leads perfectly into our last point, which is which is education. So there's lots of great signage up there about the fossils and, and the glacial history of the site and and the early history um, of, of the island. Um, but are there more things we can educate with? Or can we do that in different ways? And so we've been working with SNME, SNME to kind of develop and then implement. They're going to assist us with the implementation of this plan. So what I would like to do now is I would like to throw things over to um, Mike Rowland with SNME, who is going to speak a little bit about um, their work over the past you know, few months um, in studying the grooves and their preservation, and then also some of the potential plans we have uh, for upcoming work. So Mike, I'm going to throw things to you. All right. Well, thank you very much, JD. Uh, once again, my name is Mike Rowland, and uh, <clears throat> I work for a consultant called SNME. Uh, I am a geotechnical engineer uh, by training, and I'm serving as our project manager. And so really, as, as part of this study, of course, we need to look backwards a little bit and better understand, you know, how things have changed or perhaps have not changed over the years. And so for probably the benefit of, of some of you, others certainly know this extremely well, you know, these grooves were first exposed as part of the quarrying operations in the late 1800s to early 1900s. But when I say they were exposed, the only portion that was exposed was really the last, as we understand it, the last easternmost 30 feet or so of these. Uh, during the depression, it's our understanding that the CCC did a little bit more exposure, say another 25 to 30 foot, but really up to the early 70s, that's what the glacier grooves were. If you had gone up there to look at it, you really only saw the, the easternmost at most 50 foot of these. And seeing as they're 400 feet overall, the vast majority was still uh, covered up. And when I say covered up, covered up with soil. In 1972 and into 1973, uh, Ohio History Connection, or the Ohio Historical Society at the time, contracted with Ohio State, their geologic department, to uncover the soil that was covering up the uh, grooves. And so that took place during that time. So the vast majority of what we see today has been in place for essentially uh, 50 years. 
And so what we did is we took some photographs that had been uh, collected as part of that project back in 1972 and attempted to compare it to photographs from today. And so you can see there's a couple of examples of this um, uh, photo there from 72 and the one below it with the bridge in the background. Uh, you can see that crack on the left side. And one of the purposes of this is to better understand to what degree uh, it's been weathered. Without a doubt, these grooves have been exposed. Uh, the rain, the snow hits them. But we wanted to try to better understand how much have they changed or degraded in this 50 years. And uh, one of the things we came to realize is while there certainly has been some, no doubt about it, there's some cracking and some loose stone, from a big picture standpoint, the grooves have not actually changed as much as you might have thought they would have. Uh, much of these photos appear very similar today as they did 50 years ago. So we'll go on to the next one. So what we want to understand is what kind of things are affecting them without a doubt. They're directly exposed to weather. Within the winter time, uh, there's water in the grooves. It does freeze. Of course, it snows on it. Uh, there's only so much you can do to control that. But we also wanted to better understand what other things are going on that maybe is not so obvious. Number one is really the vegetation. Historically, the park has, uh, throughout the summer, uh, used uh, volunteer labor to kind of control this vegetation, to remove some of it. And because of that, we don't have any big trees or bushes like that growing in it, but we do have a, a bunch of small vegetation, say six inch tall or less. And clearly the root system of those, if it's allowed to continue growing, uh, will tend to degrade and crack pieces of the rock. Um, so one of the things we recognize is important that we can manage that vegetation and uh, develop a program to increase the routine uh, control of vegetation. Another question in our mind was, hey, we, we know, of course, that rain is going to directly fall onto the grooves, but are the locations where there's water coming from outside the grooves and coming into them? And the short answer is yes, there is a smaller area on the south side where water is pouring into the grooves from outside. And so that's an opportunity there to improve our stormwater management. Another question we tried to understand throughout this study is, hey, is there seepage coming through the cracks in the rock that might be contributing to either plant growth, uh, to uh, algae or other um, uh, plant or vegetation, as well as contributing to ice in the wintertime. So obviously it's one thing to be cold out if it's cold and dry, but if it's wet, you're going to get ice. So that's another aspect we looked at. We came to the conclusion that no, there really wasn't that much seepage, but there is a little bit. And, and so there's again an opportunity to minimize that. And then lastly, and what we'll talk about here on this next slide, is we look pretty hard at whether it would make sense given the exposure to the elements to try to cover these grooves either entirely or partly with some type of shelter and so this is what we refer to as our structural protection and so we you know to try to answer this question as best we could we looked at how much you know try to answer the question how much have these changed over the past 50 years we also looked at what would a shelter look like? How would it be configured in order to actually achieve what we needed it to? How would we support it? And certainly one of the questions was, in, would the shelter essentially overwhelm or take away from this, uh, as J.D. said, this spectacular natural feature? And instead, would it tend to potentially look more like it with some rocks in it rather than what we want it to be where the rocks and the grooves are the focus of any type of visitor experience. And so what we came to the conclusion of is at this point in time, it does not make sense to try to build a structure to cover these grooves up. While the, there certainly are some arguments and there will be some value to it, there's also quite a few negatives. And one of the negatives is just the size of this and the scale. Because of the slope of the grooves, there's not a lot of benefit to just covering up a small portion of them. Uh, and instead, you're you're kind of going down the path needing to cover the entire thing. 
certainly to keep it preventing it from looking like a cave, you need to have some height to the structure. And as that height gets more, it really becomes the focal point of the overall area or potentially could become. And then that photo on the right hand corner, upper right hand corner, gives you a feel for it. That's the north side of the grooves before all the plants uh, grew to the extent they have now. And you can see just how narrow that is. And so one of the concerns was how do you actually install this and yet still maintain the public access uh, opportunities? And we also were worried that there could be some negative consequences in terms of creating what we refer to as a microclimate. Uh, but there's been some past experience in the state where protective structures have caused algae to grow that hadn't been growing before. Clearly, we would lose the opportunity for sun to dry the grooves out like it does now. And so when it was all said and done, although there were certainly some arguments for it, we made the decision that at this point in time, it probably does not make sense to try to put a structure over the top of it. Rather, there's a number of other opportunities we see to improve the protection of the grooves and improve the visitor experience. And Gene Ramsey is now going to talk a little bit about some of the next steps we are going to take. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm Gene Ramsey and I'm a, a civil engineer that specializes in stormwater management and specifically decentralized stormwater management where you can take advantage of um, integrating site improvements as part of an overall uh, natural feature such as the glacial grooves. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the study element that JD mentioned at the beginning about protecting and preserving the condition of the grooves. So one of the first steps that we did was we, we had a survey done to say where, where do we have potential issues with drainage running onto the grooves and you can see from, from the slide that we have here it's a, a smaller area on the south side, as, as Mike mentioned. And the, the issue with this drainage is that the run-on will carry debris, uh, small rocks, seeds. Um, it, it's not currently significant, but uh, in terms of erosion, but you know that, that can change over time and, and it, it kind of snowballs. So this is something that we wanna mitigate while we're there, while we have the opportunity to create um, a solution that that keeps this stormwater from from migrating into the grooves both on the surface and as as mike mentioned any sort of uh, lateral subsurface movement from water seeping through the surface and then moving across into those those cracks and fissures in the grooves so what we looked at doing here um, was we, we took this as an opportunity to move the stormwater away but at the same time um, integrate some site improvements with our stormwater management, create perhaps a, a safe walkway that slopes away from the grooves rather than towards the grooves and, and fix that seepage issue. Um, what we're looking at, the view on the upper right, is the existing area that flows onto the grooves. And certainly, you know, we can see that there's a constraint there. We, we It's going to be hard for us to change what that looks like because that is the bedrock. Um, we have some existing trees that are going to be analyzed uh, soon here in the future that we're going to identify species that we want to save and species that are perhaps nuisance um, species that might be a, a root intrusion threat in the future. And then, of course, we also have this limited construction area. So these are all things that we need to take into consideration when we look at incorporating drainage improvements along with the opportunity to make the site more accessible and, and safer. And the concept detail on the lower right shows some of the improvements that are under consideration, uh, taking out the existing chain link fences and, and replacing those with better safety railings. And, and the view on the upper right here, we have the opportunity to create a walkway or surface that slopes away, and then we can intercept that stormwater runoff and keep that from getting into the grooves. So that, that's, that was the first step that we look at from a protect and preserve standpoint. And then as we're working through that process, we said, you know, beyond the protect and preserve, what else can we do while we're here to improve the visitor experience, keep people safe, um, make it accessible, and, and overall protect and preserve this natural feature? So with one of the things that Mike mentioned earlier was the, the view back over to the quarry. Um, we identified here the primary areas where if you're out there today, this is where you see everybody stopping to take pictures. 
And from a safety perspective, the bridge is only five feet wide. It gets a little bit narrow. Um, I, I've been told that, you know, people set up um, and, and try to paint, uh, you know, they, they set up a um, and, and then take photos and try to get family pictures in here. So we're looking to just improve on the circulation while at the same time uh, protecting and preserving and, and um, improving on the overall experience. Um, we started with these views. We start identifying the safety and accessibility and say, you know, what what should the experience be uh, when we encounter the grooves? Um, which leads us to this, this fantastic slide of, of a, a concept of potential improvements um, that lead to accessibility. It leads to a, a more um, overall experience that invites you in and to spend time at the grooves and not just walk over the metal bridges that are there or feel like you're constrained uh, behind a chain link fence. So as part of this study process, what came out of that are, are some of the bullet points on the upper right. Um, we want to mimic the, the undulation of the grooves as well as the glacier that created them. Uh, we really want to clear that overgrown vegetation in the slide that Mike had earlier, um, that was the really an eye opener for us when we saw how much that vegetation had encroached on what had been there previously from a visitor experience. So we want to reestablish that connection with the quarry and not just the physical connection, but the historical connection. And JD will talk about that a little bit later on in our presentation here. Um, we want to provide those widened areas to invite people to uh, spend time and, you know, get some of the knowledge and, and education about the historical background um, and then incorporate an additional walkway uh, for better overall site circulation and future tie in uh, to other um, features that we have, the historical features with the quarry. Specifically on this slide from a visual standpoint, um, on the, on the right-hand slide where we've got the, the blue coloring, we're looking at elevating that um, walkway off the end of the grooves, as you can see from those two pictures. Uh, so you would your experience would be walking along the, the bedrock at grade and then moving up a gradual ramp and having an elevated view both directions back through the view or back through the grooves and also out to the quarry. But as Mike mentioned, we didn't want the structure of any sort to become the focus. And so the things that we're working through now are, how do we best accomplish the safety improvements and the accessibility and circulation without impeding the, the experience of the grooves themselves? And now we get into a little bit more of a conceptual site plan and what we can do with those visitor experience enhancements. Um, of course, all of you who've been to different national parks um, across the country and, and um, you know, different experiences throughout the world, your, your, creati your creativity is only limited by your budget a lot of times. Um, but if this is the point where we get to look at where we have our opportunities and where we can move forward um, with some of these elements that we have under consideration, allowing people to uh, focus on specific elements of history or uh, things like the geological timeline or fossils. So that's one of the things that, that JD has been working on and we'll talk about the specifics here. We've identified areas. Where do we want people to linger? Where do we want them to stop and learn more about the history of the, the specific, how the grooves were formed or um, what's, what else is going on in the region or the island or the Great Lakes themselves? Um, some, of course, practicality, some wayfinding, um, things like that. The, the structure on the left there, we've talked about how could we possibly indicate the height of the glacier to scale over these grooves. Um, and, you know, so, so some of these really unique and creative things that we do during concept design, um, you know, some or all of these might not be included in the final version, but this is just to, to uh, present the thought process behind uh, moving forward. And then, you know, looking at some of the, the interactive element options, first and foremost, um, we need to provide safety, but we don't want that to uh, 
recreate what that chain link fence out there is doing today. We want our our safety railing to not encumber um, the visitor experience at all. Uh, we want to incorporate some of these historic documents and you know the the archival photos and try and and inter get the visitor to interact a little bit with the site. Um, specific things that we know we want these railings to be light and transparent. We don't want them to be climbable. Um, uh, you know, we're looking at options to incorporate curves and again, mimic the glaciers and mimic the grooves wherever we can. So I am going to uh, let JD talk a little bit more about the educational content that um, ODNR and, and the team members have been looking at and where the, we're at in that process. I think you're muted. Thank you very much. I really appreciate <laughs> that. And I appreciate you as well, Mike, going through that. Um, like Jean was just saying, you know, we we see this as an opportunity to absolutely build on what the Ohio History Connection has already recently done at that site with some of the signs they currently have there. Um, they touch on everything from the island history, um, the different geologic features that are at the site, the glaciations of the site. Um, the quarrying history, and, and you know, we thought, why not turn this potentially into a more, you know, 360 degree experience? Right now, most of the educational content is is located in one section of the grooves, um, and we thought, let's try to incorporate in, you know, more of these potential education stations and and do it in a way that maybe helps supplement the signage that is currently there. So um, we're still evaluating lots of the different ideas there. Um, and um, we have several site visits and things planned to kind of work out what do we want to include and, and where is the best place to include it. So, for example, uh, the Columbus limestone is is known for a lot of its great invertebrate fossils. Um, and so maybe where is the best location for us to really talk about the fossils and maybe we can show some great representations of those um, of those organisms, both the fossil organisms, but also the, uh, what they look like when they were living. And we can turn this into an educational experience, not only about the glacial grooves, but um, about the entire geology and geoheritage of the entire site. And so what I wanted to kind of leave you with now is I wanted to kind of explain what to kind of expect in the next steps um, as you're visiting up there, or you're following along on social media or uh, with the Ohio History Connection or the ODNR website. Um, what you might notice first if you're up at the site is you may notice that vegetation cleanup um, that Gene and Mike both spoke about. That's something we're going to try to um, hit the ground with this growing season and try to get some of that under control. Um, later on this year, you may notice um, some site preparations as we get, begin to um, implement some of the plans that, um, that Gene and Mike have spoken about. Um, and then really the substantial project work where you're really going to see some potential movement isn't going to be until likely next spring, next summer. Um, so we're still early stages here. Um, however, um, as these things start to occur, we wanted to make sure that you out there uh, were aware of all the exciting plans and things that we have going on. Um, so when you do see those boots on the ground and you, and you see the, the changes start happening, um, you aren't met with uncertainty, but rather you're met with excitement and anticipation of what is to come. Um, so that being said, um, um, I would like to open it up here. If there's anyone else that has a question, feel free to submit that um, to the Q&A. Um, if you are not viewing this live or you think of a question later and you would like to ask it, um, you can reach out to any one of the organizations working on this project and we're going to make sure we get you the answers that you ask. Uh, that you ask for. Um, you can reach out to the Ohio History Connection, um, to the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, either the Division of Engineering, um, or you can reach out to Kelly's Island uh, uh, Park Manager Chris Ashley as well, and we're going to make sure you get those questions answered. Um, we have received a question here from Debbie. Uh, Debbie asks, um, I was a tour guide on the island um, 30 years ago, and visitors often asked about projects like this back then. Why is it happening now? Who is involved and how is it funded? And that's a great question. Thank you very much, Debbie. Um, looking back at the very early stages of, of this project, as we were looking at it, um, we recognize that there have been similar attempts at doing something like this 
um, a couple different times in the past 50 years. Um, it was first discussed back in the 1970s after the, the full section of grooves was uncovered. Um, I know it was discussed in, in the 90s and in the, in the 2000s as well. Um, and none of those really quite got off the ground um, for various reasons. Um, some of them were, you know, funding fell through, um, administrations and leadership changes. Um, a lot of it had to do with uncertainty. There was not a lot of certainty about which direction to go. Um, what I think makes this project different and why this is happening now is we took a different approach. Um, we took the approach of we wanted to start with the study that Mike spoke um, so well about earlier, and we really wanted to make sure we were understanding what had happened, uh, what was currently happening, and what might happen from a both a preservation and a visitor experience perspective, and, and put that into writing in a way that that we felt confident in taking steps forward, and we had something that was um, that we we had confidence in moving forward. Um, Additionally, um, the Division of Geological Survey with ODNR is, is funding this project um, through our normal operating budget for um, next fiscal year. Um, and I think the other thing that makes this particular project unique is, is just the great team we have put together. As you saw on one of the earlier slides, we've been working really closely with the History Connection, multiple divisions with, with, within ODNR, um, with an outside consultant to give us that third party perspective. Um, so we just have a really great team. We're all really dedicated to making sure this gets done. Um, we have the funding for it. Um, we have the past examples to look at. So I hope that answers. Um, I hope that answers your uh, question, Debbie. Um, we do have another question here from Shep. Um, Shep asks about, and, and I might direct this question here maybe to to you, Mike. Um, Shep asks. He's wondering if there's a protective or transparent coating that can be applied to the surface of the grooves. And I know this is something that we discussed at length and put a lot of um, consideration into. Mike, do you want to comment on that or I'm happy to as well? Sure, uh, happy to. Absolutely, that, that's a good question <clears throat> and definitely one we asked ourselves. There was a couple of reasons we, we backed away from pursuing that as, a, as something that we felt like made a lot of sense. The first really was that the level, the cracking, you know, I think if, if we've been out there, if you're someone that's familiar with the grooves, there's a pretty big difference between the east end of the grooves that present the appearance of, of it's very smooth. Uh, to me, it, it's probably the most spectacular part. And as you work your way west and you're actually going uphill, you're getting into a different type of bedrock. And that bedrock is just is naturally has more joints in it. It's, it's referred to as thinly bedded. And because of that, there's there's pretty good sized cracks out there. And from what we could tell, I want these cracks had been there from when it was first uncovered. And for that reason, our, our, we had two concerns. One is, are we really going to be able to get a protective coating to stick when you have the larger joints in it? Two, is it possible that by applying a protective coating that it actually will impede any type of water that might be wanting to come out? And you say, well, isn't that a good thing? But the worry is, is that, well, if it doesn't come out at the usual joint, is it going to create something new, a new crack? And, and while we do plan to take some steps to minimize seepage, we know we're still going to get some. And then I guess three, and I know I said I had two, but the third one is, is there a potential we're going to cause more harm? So initially it might look really good, but then as this material weathers, is it going to then look splotchy and, and really detract from the grooves themselves? And for all those reasons, why we, we did consider it, we backed away from it. I'm not sure if anyone else wants to touch on that, but that, that was kind of our thought process from our perspective. That's great. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I think one of the biggest concerns we had that you just touched on was we looked at a lot of other sites around the country and 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 other and internationally as well where protective coatings had been applied and you know sometimes we were we were cautioned uh, um depending on how um depending on the climate you just don't exactly know how those are going to hold up and sometimes we didn't want to do anything that might potentially cause irreversible harm but um excellent question thank you very much Shep. Um, 
I think um, I don't see any other questions here at the moment. Um, so if you do have additional questions and you would like to submit them, um, feel free to submit them to any of the, um, the emails or, or you can call in with any of the numbers there that are on the screen. Um, and I would encourage you to do so if you, if you think of anything. Um, as we have updates, um, you can follow um, the Division of Geological Survey um, ODNR page on Facebook and we'll be put posting potential updates there. Um, if you have questions um, about um, specific activities that might be happening up at the glacial grooves, um, we can reach out to Chris Ashley and, and he can give you those updates or direct you um, and to where you can find um, updates about uh, activities as we progress here over the next several months. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in and wish you a nice, pleasant rest of your day. Thanks.